Brooklyn Music House Hyperballad specializes in music for picture. Using an international ad campaign as a case study, we find out how their compositional process is influenced by working to a brief, incorporating client feedback, and having to deliver alternative versions for different media. My name is Jonathan Benedict. We're at Hyperballad Studios, and I'm the creative director and composer and co-founder of Hyperballad. We do a variety of things. We work on uh, record making, and we're, we're also songwriters and everybody that we work with, everybody in the, in the mix here is, is an artist and in some cases a DJ too, but we also do a lot of music for picture. So we're writing for commercials, we're writing for feature films, we're writing for indie films and uh, really everything in between. I mean, there's just a lot of, a lot of different kind of projects that walk in the door. My name is Rob Niederprum and I am the executive producer here at Hyperballad and I am also the co-owner. The role tends to vary from project to project. Um, it's always liaising with the client and kind of just keeping abreast of dates and everything with the client. In addition to that, it's overseeing the creative and the direction of the project. You know, we work with various writers, we're bringing in multiple musicians throughout throughout the process and kind of just keeping the central focus of the creative. It's really just guiding that and making sure that we are staying on track because we are operating in a really short window when we're doing these things. You know, it's really about three to four days tops that we get to turn things around and sometimes it's even shorter than that. Today we're going to be talking about a piece of music that we wrote for a commercial. is for a cosmetics company. And uh, it turned out to be a really fun one because the commercial itself was uh, presented to us in a long form. So it was a 60 second commercial with many cut downs, 30, 15, and even smaller ones. But it meant that we were able to approach it like a song and incorporate all that kind of musicianship and, and really use the studio to its fullest. And I should say that that doesn't always happen because sometimes commercials are uh, such a fast turnaround or so narrow in the direction that you're really just working with a lot of samples and mini tracks and and that's fine and we, we do our best to make as great music as we can with, under those circumstances but in this case it was clear from the onset that we we're gonna be able to have a little fun with it and get some of the players that we love into the studio and record them and and use all the gear we have and really make something that, that we think is pretty special. We, we've been in here for about a year now and it was, it's been a, it was a long time coming. We had a very small like two room studio um, with pretty much all of the gear that we have here packed into it. It uh, was just really on top of it itself. Um, but we, this was always our goal is to build a facility like this that is one set up how we work. We also w wanted to create a facility that allowed us to have multiple producers and engineers and artists kind of working at all times. There's always people around, there's always people working, there's always different artists coming in, there's different musicians coming in. It really allows for everyone to be together and like collaborate. This, this particular job was exciting to us because we, uh, we learned from the onset that it was going to be a, a single bid job, which meant that we were the only music house that was going to be involved. And we knew that creatively we were going to have the chance to, to try some different ideas musically. Uh, when there's a multiple bid, which is the, the typical bidding kind of situation, we're competing against other music houses and we generally have to cleave very closely to what the client is asking for. And in this case, that still remains true, but knowing that it's our job and that we have the sort of creative license to try things means we can be a little bit more creative and hopefully experimental with it. The brief from the client was that they wanted some music that was fun and irreverent with this kind of 60s spy thriller or spy theme kind of feel to it and that they wanted at the same time to be modern. So we quickly realized that what we should, what we should do is give them some, some music that's really a classic song in a lot of ways, but that has 
these sort of 60s kind of elements in it used as samples. So that way we're kind of bridging the gap between an actual 60s recording and what people are looking for in a modern recording. So we, we thought about how we were going to capture some of, these, some of these different elements, drums, bass, horn sections, and, uh, and then use that in the context of an arrangement with vocals, but use samples of those elements and then rearrange them with a beat. We had the creative call and we learned that we were gonna have to turn around the music in three to four days. And given the kind of music brief that they had given us, we thought about it and we decided to focus our energies on just doing four tracks. Usually we do a lot more. Usually we do anywhere from eight to even 15 to 20 tracks on some of the jobs. So it really depends. But in this case, because it was a longer commercial, because it was going to incorporate a lot of real, real musicianship and, and tracking of real instruments and this sort of thing, which is time consuming, we, we knew that we should just try to focus on a few ideas and really make them count. Sometimes the client has a reference track that they are liking elements of, and other times it's kind of just a clean slate. If there is an inspiration track, and uh, you, you kind of like deconstruct it a little bit, draw on things that are going to inspire you to go and create you know, multiple pieces of music. So I'd love to play one of the ideas for you, which ended up going the distance and being the one that they, they chose. So this was called Ray Ray. This was, the, this was the first version that we sent over, along with three other tracks. At that point, we wanted to give them a few options. We were confident about everything that we were sending over. We, we really liked a lot of the elements that were incorporated into this one, so I think we were maybe hoping that they would choose this one. And the feedback came back very positive, and they were, they were really interested in working on this one with us and refining it. The, the way this version evolved was that we knew that we were going to write something that had a, a song form to it. So it started at the piano, and we worked out chords, we worked out melodies, and based on that, we put together a, a simple arrangement. And then it became time to think about how are we going to bring this to life, and what are the sort of retro elements that we're going to focus on in order to make this kind of a, a cool, vibey sort of recording. And we realized that we needed to have a good rhythm track to kind of kick things off. So I started by programming some, some drums in, in native instruments using the, the 60s Abbey Road kits that they have. And then took those sounds um, along with some upright bass sounds that uh, were also from a, a different native instruments sample. And then ran them through the board and then put them completely to the left and the right. So giving it that sort of that completely panned left, left right retro feel that a lot of 60s records have. And then we used those sounds through the board to run to the, the tape machine, which is an ATR 102 that we have over in the corner. And we added some, some reverb from the BX10, which is an old spring reverb. So we were running it through the board, we were hitting tape, we, uh, we were adding some spring reverb, and all this was going a good distance to kind of give it this 
authentic kind of grit and give it some, some personality and character. And of course, before we even got to that stage, we were making sure that the, the timings of the performances, the way that the bass and the way, the way that the drums were feeling, the groove and all the sort of inflections were really feeling spot on and, and had that kind of energy that we were looking for. So together, all those things, once we, we hit tape, gave us kind of a nice building block for the, the track overall. But we knew that wasn't going to be enough. That was just kind of the first, the first cornerstone. So we then started thinking about what other musicians we wanted to bring in. And we knew that one of the things that was going to make the track feel special is if we could have real drums on it. I want to show you guys the, the raw Pro Tools session that we had. What's going on in this session is you're seeing kind of the, the raw elements that we were trying to just very quickly capture and then reuse in the other songs that we had. So most of the things on the screen relate to some of the other tracks that we were working on at the time. The one part that we ended up using in the, in the Ray Ray song which uh, was this kind of really fast drum part. So you can see that here, but you can also see some of the bass parts and some of the other drum parts that are really were tailored to some of the other uh, tracks that we were working on. The process here was that we, we wanted to get um, a rough scratch arrangement of the song in the drummer's cans and then have him play along with it. But the goal was to play very fast with this kind of surf rock style. So he would be playing over top of it, but he'd be doing tons of fills. And I think we were just encouraging him to really go for it. We really wanted to get just tons of energy and excitement and really kind of like blow it out. So uh, he was happy to do this and uh, really went for it and we, we, were, we were pleased with how it sounded. And then we took those sounds that we captured that day and cut them up and used them as samples in the, in the main production. We were talking about the main drum loop part, the drum and the bass. So that loop has the drums hard panned, it has the bass hard panned, that's what we ran through the board, we ran to the tape machine, gave it some reverb and brought it back into the computer. So that was our sort of first building block for the, for the session. Then we added uh, some of these faster drums that we tracked separately. Then we wanted to think about the, the harmonic side of it. So I played some Rhodes on it, I played some organ on it, but we also brought in um, a, a sax player and we laid some, some sax parts down and stacked them. And we brought in a trumpet player and then had the trumpet layered on top of that. We wanted to get those brass parts on there and the sax parts on there because the samples just don't completely do it justice these days. And there, there are great samples out there, don't get me wrong, but in order to get the, the kind of articulation and the sort of the real feel that we were looking for, we had to, to bring in players to do that stuff. So we, we quickly recorded those elements. We also recorded some percussion elements in our, in our live room. So together with the, the drums and the, the horn parts and the percussion elements on top of the samples that we started out with, the track really started to get some of those organic qualities, those groovy kind of qualities that we were looking for. The idea that we gave them, which is here, was a pretty fully realized idea from our perspective. And Fortunately, they agreed and they were, they were pretty happy about it. Out of the four tracks that we sent over, they, they wanted to focus in on this, this track, Ray Ray, which we were super excited about. And it already had vocals and lyrics on it, and they liked the vocals, they liked the lyrics. 
but they wanted to hear some, some, some different uh, angles on that. They wanted to try some lyrical rewrites. Lyrically, one of the things that they were interested in us focusing on was uh, a kind of contrast. So they would have uh, the idea of East versus West, uh, night versus day, um, one side versus the other side, kind of a feel. So we incorporated that into the lyrics. We, we used the, this East-West language and we used uh, two sides of every story as kind of themes for the lyrics. And then based on that, which they were, they were, they were into, they wanted us to go further and try a few different options. We, we gave them two alternate ideas based on that. So here's the first one. And here's the other one. They also wanted to experiment with um, a little bit of scat singing as well to sort of see what's the best balance here because at the end of the day they, they really were into the music but they didn't want it to steal too much attention from the visuals. So the, uh, the goal therefore is to do the music and the vocals in such a way that it feels effortlessly like a song but at the same time doesn't distract you or take anything away from what's going on screen. So to that end, we had our singer come back and she tried a few different approaches with us. One of them was to swap, switch the lyrics so that we had a couple different lyrical options for them. Another thing that we did was experiment with her scat singing. Early on in the writing process, when I was working on the, just the basic chords and the melodies, it dawned on me that since they want the music to be really, really believable and authentic, but at the same time they want it to kind of stay out of the way of what's going on visually, it would be useful if we had some kind of vocal hook that was almost like a scat singing kind of thing, but it can't really seem too jazzy. It really needs to be like a, a, a completely thought out melody idea, but just wordless. So after playing around with some, some ideas al along those lines, this uh, Bampadu idea started to form. And once we had that, I got excited because I felt like, okay, this is really gonna, this is gonna really help deliver all this music. This is gonna be the thing that kind of puts, um, puts this over the edge in terms of them liking it. It's kind of got this fun, irreverent sort of energy. It feels kind of international. It feels kind of retro. It reminds you of certain things, but doesn't sound literally just like anything. So it's not stepping on the toes of anything. And it's memorable. It's kind of a, it's a good, it's a, it's a hook that, that you kind of take away from, from the spot and, and remember. So knowing that it had all those different components to it, I was, I was thinking this is, this is a good step forward. So altogether we gave them Two different ideas that had uh, a separate set of lyrics, but working with the same melody. And then we gave them another idea, which was just the first little bit of lyrics and then scat singing so that they could reflect on all that and think about what was going to work best against the picture. So the revision process was a back and forth where we gave them a version initially that had lyrics, it had melodies, they liked what they were hearing, they asked for some, some changes and we gave them a whole range of options to kind of pick and choose and just try out ideas so that they can understand what, what's going to work best for them. In this case, I think we, we had five different revisions of the track 
but that doesn't include all the sort of sub revisions. Like we might have an option A, option B, or Rev 5.1A, 5.1B. So altogether, I'm, I'm guessing, but there were probably 17 or 18 different versions of the track at different points that were being shared between us and the and the, the client. So that's fairly typical. I mean, there's usually a, a healthy amount of revision in any of these commercial jobs, which is why the whole notion of how much of the music is going to be real instruments that you've tracked and recorded as audio and how much of it is going to be flexible in the form of MIDI plugins and virtual instruments. That's why that, that sort of, uh, that, that issue is so central to what we do. So this one is one where we, we, we sort of picked our battles and we wanted to incorporate a lot of that, the real singing, obviously, but the real sax, the real trumpet, the real drums and, and, and whatnot. We wanted to incorporate all that, um, but just keep enough flexibility in what we had by approaching it in a kind of modular way so that we could still modify the arrangement as needed. And, uh, and it worked out. When you're writing music for a commercial and the cut itself is changing all the time and the, the, the music and the picture is being shared with different people at different times. So for instance, you have your creative team and the producer working with you on the music, then they might be showing it to the, the head of the company, then it might be going over to the client, there might be other parties involved. So all of this means that it's, it's sort of a moving target, it's, it's always changing. So there is a lot of revisions that are happening all the time. The way we try to tackle it is to figure out the answer musically. So we might make a section a little bit longer, we might make a section a little bit shorter, we might add a fill, we might have to create a little bit of a, um, a space, like a musical rest here or there where one didn't exist before. But generally, we're always approaching it in terms of the musical content itself versus, for instance, turning on flex time and just changing the tempo or sort of manipulating the audio itself. That's kind of a last resort. We, we, we almost never use that as a, as a solution. Now we're at a stage in the process where we've been through a few revisions with the agency and they're weighing which of the lyrical options or the scat singing option, which one is the, is the best suited to what they're, they're looking to achieve. And in the end, they picked option one. They said that they, they really thought the lyrics were, were all working. They loved the energy, they loved the melodies. They wanted to share it with the, the client. The only thing was they were looking for the mix overall to be just more exciting. They wanted the parts, the dynamics of the track to feel more extreme. They wanted the parts to feel uh, different and, and have new elements coming in and out, more than already existed up to this point. So that brings us to the next stage of sort of now refining the track, working on the mix itself and working on uh, adding a few percussion elements here or there that don't change the overall feel of the track, but just give it more excitement. My name's Alex Hamity. I work for Hybrid Ballad and uh, I guess I'm producer, writer, composer, uh, sound designer. On this particular track, um, I added kind of just musical additions and did some mixing and we well, did the final mix, I guess, and uh, also did a lot of the cut downs as well. A cut down is just an abbreviated version of uh, the commercial that usually goes to different media mediums. Like, so usually we'll do a 30 second commercial, it goes to TV, and then the 15 will be for the internet. And then a five will be, you know, just like a short little, I guess like ad, like advert, you know, that kind of pops up. And the difficulties are is if you have a 30 second piece of music, for example, or in this case, a 60 piece, second piece, where you have all the ideas, you know, laid out. And sometimes the ideas aren't, are already abbreviated because you're dealing in such a, you know, constrained amount of time. Then you have to further cut down what is essentially already cut down, if that makes sense. So if you have a, a 60 second and you have a intro, a verse, a pre-chorus, a chorus, um, a second verse and an outro, sometimes they'll want all of that cut down to a 30. 
So you have to figure out like, okay, well our intros, rather than like a full intro, we're just gonna have a drum fill. And the pre-chorus is just gonna be one chord that leads up to the chorus rather than the three chord progression. So that's where it gets a little tricky because you kind of have to start doing like Jenga, Tetris with your sessions, but it has to sound musical. And we usually do get away with it, but yeah, we've been doing this for a while. So we kind of, we don't really have a system for it, but we kind of just know what to do when these cut downs happen. Weirdly enough, if it's 60 seconds, it's actually harder to do cut downs, which is you think it would be the opposite because usually with a 30, you know, you have less to work with and it's like you kind of already crammed your musical idea in 30 seconds or 15 seconds. But 60, you have like, you have a full musical idea. A lot of times with like a full chorus, a pre-chorus, intro, outro. So sometimes to like go from that to like 15 seconds, you're like, okay, well, I guess, uh, do we have to lose something? Or sometimes we end up including all of the pieces, or I'm sorry, all the parts of the piece, including like the intro, pre-chorus, chorus, outro in 15 seconds. Don't be afraid to go out of time or sometimes out of key, as long as it's visually coherent. So sometimes we'll collapse something that's like, we'll just go completely off the grid. We'll collapse it by like a measure and one eighth or something like that. But if you're looking on the screen, when like the product shot comes, it makes sense. So sometimes you kind of, I guess, split the difference between what musically sounds good, but also what visually is coherent. We did this actually for me, we've been making music for commercials for like 10 years now, and we always give unique names to our tracks, always. So most houses will be like, I don't know if the product's like good soap or whatever. It'll be like good soap version one, good soap version two, good soap version three, et cetera, et cetera. But like we always pick a theme like based on like a movie or an actor or actress, whatever, and we stick to that and we always have unique names. So the client, the creatives, they always remember the names and as a tendency sometimes to stick out above the other houses. Cause like for this, they'll be like, oh, like we're between, you know, Riri or makeup product V3. You know, they'll sometimes gravitate towards a name they can like hold on to. So that's a little, that's something we, we've been doing and it seems to always get positive responses from the uh, creatives. One of the biggest differences I would say between doing like working with artists or making music for yourself or say in any other capacity is that in commercial music you you have to be very decisive you have a small window to create multiple tracks um, some you know three days sometimes so you really you you have to pick a sound or you have to like decide on an instrument and you have to like let that be like let that be the foundation and go from there and you kind of you can't look back and in a way, that's kind of like one of the, the funner aspects of it, because you, you take a lot more chances. You're not so focused on getting something just perfect. You're, you're really more focused on just c composing, and it's freeing in that sense, where you can just, you, you throw a lot of ideas at the wall, and you see what sticks, and it, it can be surprising and, and fun, and that's one of the, the more liberating aspects of like doing commercial music. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it and to subscribe to the Sound on Sound YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.